Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The 2015 Canadian federal elections will be held on October 19th to elect members of the House of Commons. On Thursday night, the first of the debates took place among the party leaders, Prime Minister Stephen Harper for the Conservatives, Tom Mulcair for the New Democratic Party, Justin Trudeau for the Liberals, and Elizabeth May for the Green Party. They teed off with this debate in what is expected to be the longest campaign in modern history in Canada. Come splitting for our pensioners. I know something the other parties oppose, but they appreciate it. We've, we've, Mr. Ma Harper, we've made the Mr. rules Harper, for rifts simply more true. generous. Mr. Harper, we made rules for Paul, rifts Mr. more generous. Mr. Harper, we have has not, been we're, putting we're not, that we're, out. We're not halfway done this in, segment on the Mr. economy. Mr. Harper so has been putting that time. out in misleading attack ads, uh, and none of the other parties have ever talked about touching, and I'm including Mr. Mulcair on this one, touching income splitting Mr. for seniors. You voted you are against income splitting, splitting for that, Mr. Harper. Let's get right into the analysis of how the candidates did in the debate. For that, I'm joined by Jordan Brennan. Jordan is an economist for Unifor and co-author of the recent report, Rhetoric and Reality, Evaluating Canada's Economic Record under the Harper government. I'm also joined by Nora Loretto. She's the author of From Demonize to Organize, Building the New Union Movement. She's also the editor of Rabble.ca's series titled Up! Canadian Labor Rising. And I'm also joined by Jason Skies. He is, until recently, an adjunct professor of political science at Brock University. I thank you all for joining me today. Thanks thank for you. having me. Let me first get a take from each of you in terms of how the candidates actually did in the debate. Let me start with you, uh, Nora. Yeah, well, I think um, it was what we can expect from a debate that's only in the first couple of days of a very long election campaign. There were no disasters. Uh, uh, Justin Trudeau probably did better than uh, most people were anticipating he would do, uh, but then he ended the debate with a very strange uh, patriotic speech that I think undid a lot of what he had built up the, the previous two hours. And for me, the, the big question was, how would Tom Mulcair do? For a guy who we're, we're used to seeing be very strong, in question period, I thought that he was uh, pretty disappointing. He spoke very slowly and he uh, kind of fell into a lot of traps that I think uh, were set for him by, by Harper. Uh, and finally, Harper himself, uh, I felt it refreshing just to hear him answer questions for the first time in a long time. Um, and so great uh, first debate, um, but definitely no one is winning or losing this election because of last night's performance. Jason, your take? Uh, I, I agree with a lot of what uh, what Nora just said there. Um, to me, one of the big takeaways, the big standouts for me was Elizabeth May. Uh, I think a lot of people who watched that debate really realized how uh, how well put together, how well thought out her positions are, uh, how articulate she is. Um, I, I do want to say that you have to put the caveat in there that there's still in the, the subconscious the recognition of, of the fact that her party has so little standing. Um, and that's really unfortunate, I think. Um, Trudeau did a great job, um, although the expectations were low. I mean, you had his advisors saying that if he showed up with his pants on, it was a victory. Uh, that's probably the, the greatest low balling I've ever heard of a, you know, a, a participant in a debate. Um, and, you know, while I agree that it was nice to hear Stephen Harper answer questions, um, he still does so in the way that uh, that I think puts off a lot of people in that he manipulates the facts. He sort of tells half truths, um, which I don't think um, will will play out well uh, to the vast majority of Canadians over the long run. And and I don't think uh, Mulcair did himself a very good service uh, last night. I think at times he was too reserved. At times he was too animated. Um, maybe it was that he didn't want to take any big risks. They're in, in a good position in the polls. Uh, but I think if I had to pick a, a winner, per se, it would be somewhere between Trudeau and May. And Jordan, yours? Well, I guess it depends on, first, how you look at it. I, I think the, the various leaders were speaking to different segments of the voting public. And so, so Stephen Harper is not speaking to the left end of the spectrum. He's not speaking to environmentalists. He's got social conservatives already. They have nowhere else to go uh, voting-wise. So he's trying to, to, to scoop up the business liberals, those at the center of the spectrum, and he's speaking to them, advertising things that will resonate with them, namely 
the, the economy uh, and energy and potentially national security. Uh, I, I actually thought Harper was quite vulnerable on those topics. Uh, he, he's going to advertise and has advertised himself on his strong economic credentials. I think he's much more vulnerable there uh, than he'd like to be. Uh, and factually speaking, not from the standpoint of, of what he said, he made a couple of statements that I think are either just false or are so warped as to be effectively false. And the other leaders, I would have been happy if they had uh, gone at him a bit more. Uh, I think Elizabeth May, because her base is the smallest and she has the least to lose, actually said some of the most interesting things uh, in, in the debate. She was talking about corporate cash hoarding. She, she mentioned the uh, foreign uh, investment deal, the investment liberalization deal Canada has with China, which has some scandalous elements. Um, and so that was, for me, refreshing that she could bring that to the debate where the other leaders maybe were focused on trying to win those swing voters. Right. Uh, speaking of the economy, let's just take a look at what uh, Mulcair charged uh, Harper with in, a, in the debate. What Mr. Harper fails to mention is that he's run up eight deficits in a row. He's added $150 billion to Canada's debt in the last 10 years. And frankly, last week, as we headed into this campaign, in just one day, he spent over a billion dollars. Honestly, Mr. Harper, we really can't afford another four years we have of a, you. We have a budget that is... Uh, Jordan Brennan, let me get your take on uh, the charge that uh, Mulcair uh, made on uh, Stephen Harper and also elaborate on Stephen Harper's uh, economic record. You've been working on this issue. Well, I, I think uh, he was right to go after the economic record, uh, and that's a nice sound bite, but I, I would have liked to uh, see a bit more flesh behind the statement. So, for example, Harper made two claims near the beginning of the debate, the debate that uh, his government uh, has, that Canada has the highest economic growth of any major uh, economy, and it has the most robust job creation. Both of those statements are false. Uh, Canada has fared very poorly compared to the OACD, that's the organization, uh, the, the, the economic organization of the 34 richest, most advanced countries. We're in the bottom half of that group uh, in terms of economic growth and job creation and other indicators that he flagged, such as exports. We've also done very, very poorly under his record, amazingly poorly, uh, given how important uh, exports and especially energy exports are for Canada. So I think he's much more vulnerable than uh, on the economy file than the other leaders uh, indicated. Jordan, uh, how does a prime minister standing in front of the entire nation uh, make false statistical uh, conclusions and get away with it? Well, that was, for me, the most disappointing or, or frustrating part of the debate that, you know, listen, we tend to think that People are rational, they take in information and they coolly assess it, you know, using their intellect. But I think that our intellect is underpinned largely by our emotions. And so people, it's not what the leaders say so much, it's important what they say, but more important than what they say is how they make the voters feel. So does Stephen Harper convey economic competence, managerial competence? Uh, I think that that's what he's selling himself on. The facts, I don't think, are in support of, of, of his claims. And he can get away with betting the facts because how many Canadians actually know the rate of job creation in this country? Yeah. Very, Nora, very... let me go to you. The candidates that were challenging Harper were very poor at challenging his uh, statistics, his rolling out. Uh, what's your take? Uh, Harper has waged an assault on facts since he became prime minister. So what we saw last night is is the, the result of what happens when you have a governmental regime that attacks scientists and attacks science and attacks statistics and attacks researchers and education. So um, to, to imagine that we're going to have a situation where Stephen Harper is not going to lie is is just impossible like he's he's incapable of standing up and saying what is the truth because he's built a career on manufacturing truth and and serving it to people to try to convince them to vote for him so i'm i'm a little bit concerned that that seemed to to rope in the other leaders uh, to try and correct those facts i think elizabeth may did a very good job at trying to correct those facts but the fact is 
Harper is defining this uh, this entire election on his terms, and his terms are not true. So what we really need to see from the other leaders is a complete repackaging of what is the economy and, and how does the economy feel to average people. Um, we know uh, that we've got one set of facts that are not true. We have actual facts that are true. And then we have the, the, the daily struggles of average Canadians just trying to get by who are mired in uh, high levels, record high levels of household debt, um, record high levels of, of precarity within the work the workplace, um, and, and people working full time and not being able to cover their basic expenses. So what, what the other parties really need to do is, is refuse to play on the frame uh, that, that Harper has set because they can't win because they can't lie as well as he can lie. Um, and so I, I think that we're gonna see certainly the NDP because Mulcair is a master debater. Um, we'll see the NDP come back, I think, trying to figure out how he can recapture the, 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 the frame and, and, and re-spin these issues in the next televised debate. Um, and, and with Trudeau, the problem is, of course, they're dealing with an intellectual lightweight. And so how can you get someone like Trudeau to start taking control of some of these issues, and I'm, I'm not totally sure you can. The, the one thing that I thought was fascinating was the juxtaposition of Elizabeth May with Mulcair, where she seemed genuine and smart and on the ball, and Mulcair seemed robotic and strange and using his, his big eyes at the camera. Uh, I don't think that we'll see a, a performance like this again. I think that we're going to see uh, things getting uh, better. And of course, this was potentially the last uh, the last debate that L Elizabeth May is even going to participate in, which will change the tenor and the quality of the discussion. Jason, uh, what about you? What's the stark reality of uh, what they presented in terms of the economy uh, in the debate and your take on it? Uh, I don't disagree very far from my two colleagues. I think there's a couple of things to add. Uh, I think that uh, it's true that, that Mr. Harper does like to sort of make up the facts as he goes along, but this is a pattern that has developed over time with this prime minister. Uh, and this goes back, I mean, even to things like the F-35 debate, right? Um, he hired the PBO, the Parliamentary Budget Officer, uh, to overlook the books and to confirm the status of our finances as a country. This is in the wake of the sponsorship scandal and the Conservatives' promises to be open and transparent and accountable. Uh, and yet, whenever those numbers uh, disagree with, with how the Conservatives want to spin their government and their position, they simply say, oh, we disagree, right? Uh, we said the, the government said that the F-35s were going to cost 12 or 14 billion, and then the PBO came out and said 30 billion. And the government just said, we disagree. Uh, right now, we have... Um, the government repeating over and over again until perhaps last night when perhaps Mulcair caught out Mr. Harper on uh, the status of recession in the country. Uh, but Joe Oliver has been saying, no, oh, no recession, no recession, no recession, no deficit, no deficit, no deficit. And then you have the PBO come out and say, look, you're looking at about a $1.4 billion deficit, no matter what the government says. And yet the government will simply say, we disagree. Um, this is a pattern with this government. Um, now, there, there, Jason, point, there was a, uh, a point at which uh, Prime Minister Harper actually admitted that the economy has may, perhaps shrunk in the energy sector, but not the other sectors. Is there any truth to that? I think there is some truth to that. Uh, Jordan, I'm sure, uh, has, has a lot to say on this, and his report is fantastic, by the way. Great work, Jordan. Um, but... There is some some truth about the fact that, yes, a, a lot of the recession, a lot of the decline in the economy certainly is playing into or is being affected by the downturn in the oil sector. However, he has to then bear the burden of the fact that he has chosen over the last near decade to put so many of our eggs in that oil basket. Uh, the, the impact of uh, outsourcing of manufacturing jobs and service jobs overseas – leaves us with very little recourse to create a solid foundation for an economy, uh, one of which has obviously been uh, primary extraction of resources. Well, that makes you extraordinarily vulnerable to international markets, which, yes, are out of your control, but you do have the control of whether or not that is the foundation of your economy. And that's a choice this government has made. Um, Jordan, give us a take on the uh, what Prime Minister Harper uh, claimed that the energy sector has perhaps shrunk, but the rest of the economy in Canada is actually doing well. 
Well, Mulcair uh, made a statement that was correct, that since 2006, when Harper became prime minister, we've lost nearly 400,000 manufacturing jobs. In that same time, we've gained uh, about 60,000 energy and mining jobs. So that's a trade-off there of roughly six or seven to one. Uh, for every job we've gained in Alberta energy, for example, now looking provincially, for every job we've gained in Alberta energy, uh, we have lost seven, six or seven jobs in Ontario's manufacturing. And those are very good paying jobs. They're hard to replace in terms of their position on the wage spectrum. Uh, many jobs being replaced are part-time and uh, their the compensation packages tend to be much, much lower. So uh, I think that on this file, he is, uh, that Jason was correct, that by, by shifting the focus of national policy to energy, which only employs at its peak, energy and mining together, only employ at its peak 2% of Canada's workforce. It's very small in terms of employment. It's, out, it's outsized in terms of its policy significance, but its employment uh, is actually roughly 2%. So to, to put all our, our, our emphasis, our policy emphasis on that was misplaced. Now, Harper's going to claim that it's not his fault that commodity prices are falling, that it wasn't his government's doing. But it wasn't his government's doing that commodity prices were rising when he took office, that we, had, we went through a commodity super cycle since 2002, surging commodity prices across the board. It's not just natural gas and oil. It's, it's agricultural commodities like wheat, it's precious metals like uh, gold, all those prices soared up. And so we got a commodity boom, which he inherited, it wasn't his doing. And so the question is, now that the boom has turned to bust, what are we left with? Well, we're, 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 we're 600,000 manufacturing jobs less than in 2002. So manufacturing is not there to pick up the slack. And I think that's one big reason we are, we are headed into recession is, is we didn't invest and we didn't plan to renew our advanced manufacturing sector. And that's what's going to drag us down, at least in part. Nora, let me get your take on how uh, Mulcair did in terms of the proposal on the table that uh, he was talking about in terms of job creation. Yeah, it was another point where I was, I was pretty disappointed with, with Mulcair. Um, he, he started off by trying to talk about childcare as part of the economic plan which I think is important because the uh, the return on investment for hiring and uh, for hiring uh, childcare workers is actually very good. It's it's better than most uh, construction jobs. Um, but he he didn't he didn't elaborate enough. Like there was no talk about about uh, a pu financing public transit, for example, and how if you want to have a massive infrastructure overhaul of public transit, that that is a job creation strategy. Um, it, Elizabeth May kind of alluded to that, th that when she was talking about infrastructure investments, but I thought that it was pretty weak, um, partly because I'm sure he was trying to play it really safe. And, um, and we're in this weird situation where we're having a leaders debate on uh, during election where there's actually only been one policy announced during the election. Um, so surely the, the parties are trying to hold their cards close to their chest. They haven't really unveiled what they're planning to promise. Uh, certainly we have things that have kind of been talked about or promised before the writ drop, but during the election campaign period, it's still, it's still quite unclear where the parties are gonna go. And so I thought that, that it was a missed opportunity. And, and because he didn't get to talk about anything further than, well, we're going to support manufacturing, which is turns more into a buzzword because it doesn't really mean anything if you don't explain how. Um, we, he got, as I said before, he got sucked into this trap of this narrow definition of what the economy is. Um, and and the, the terms of the debate were totally controlled by Harper. And, and, and Mark, Mulcair is not going to be able to win at a debate that is controlled by Harper. And Jason, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, uh, I, I really don't. Oh, well, maybe a little. I, I would go back to Jordan's point earlier, uh, which is the the other leaders, Mulcair himself as, as well, they're sort of trapped uh, because of what Jordan alluded to, which is that the, the average Canadian doesn't understand the facts, right? They don't understand uh, how, to, how do you determine GDP or average, per capita GDP or economic growth, et cetera. And so that allows um, Harper, essentially, to sort of say what he wants to say. And all that the other leaders have as an alternative is to sort of say their numbers as well. But 
that doesn't tell the public who to believe. Um, that being said, I think there is some truth that Canadians are feeling the downturn in the economy. Canadians are feeling, Canadians know that their kids aren't able to find jobs like they did coming out of university or, or college or high school. Uh, Canadians know that people are trying to cobble together multiple part-time precarious jobs just to scramble together enough money uh, to live while we have rising prices for housing and for food and et cetera. So uh, there's only so far, I think, that, that Mr. Harper can can try to spin this economy as good and solid and, and heading in the right direction. At some point, it does boil down to the lived experience, to the feeling that people have. Um, whether that's this election, I'm not sure. Um, I still think there is a chance that Harper can spin this, and enough people will believe. Um, we'll see what happens. Jo jo Care, Jordan, really give us some facts on where the economy is at, uh, Har Harper's, uh, you know, leadership uh, and the declining economy um, have some patterns, obviously. Can you highlight some of the stats uh, that uh, we're going into this election with in terms of the economy? Yeah, sure. So if we were actually to chart the long-term history of Canada's economic performance, I've done this all the way back to 1870, to the beginning of Confederation. Uh, economic growth in recent times, in the last couple of decades, has been lower than any time since uh, the 1930s, since the Great Depression. Job creation is at a post-war low. Uh, that, that's a major engine of growth, is how many people are working. That seems to be the key uh, element. Uh, business investment, not mergers and acquisitions, but business investment in building new structures, hiring new workers, that has been oscillating around a post-war low for a couple of decades. Tax cuts, amazingly, he said this. He said that we cut taxes and that will stimulate investment. Trudeau seems to believe the same thing. Well, Stephen Harper reduced taxes by one-third since 2006, corporate income taxes uh, Thanks, by one-third. And, and we have not seen an uptick in investment. Uh, we've actually reduced taxes by one half since the late 1980s, and investment has hung around at a post-war low. So tax cuts are simply, as far as I can tell, a redistribution mechanism towards the corporate sector and upwards across the income spectrum. So that is a failure. Exports, the failure to stimulate exports, that's a key determinant of growth as well. And the composition of our exports has shifted away from uh, industrially diversified products towards natural resources. And that is a big problem as well, because the commodities bust is going to mean that our exports plummet. Uh, so that is also going to be a drag on growth. I think they're extraordinarily weak on those core economic measures to say nothing of progressive economic indicators like household debt, like the distribution of income, and so on. All right, uh, Nora, let me give you the last word in terms of uh, your plan for job creation, your plan for job creation? <laughs> My plan. Um, well, I think uh, the, the, the most important thing is, is, is looking at what Harper's record is in terms of attacking workers, right? This is a prime minister who despises unions more than probably many prime ministers have in the in the post-war period and um and and rarely do we talk about uh, in the in the in the resource extractive industry how many workers are killed for example right there was there was a nine workers killed in alberta in a span of a couple of weeks last november and it barely made any news um and so i think what what we really need to see is 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 the ndp refusing to use the language of Harper and start talking to average Canadians who are workers, uh, whether or not they're unionized, and, and say, look, we understand the same struggles that, that, that you are going to, and then here is our plan to, to alleviate those struggles. And that the plan needs to not just include childcare, but they need to have a position on, on education, higher education, post-secondary uh, tuition fees is critical. Uh, national student debt has, is now able to reach $24 billion, and that was a policy change made in May when no one covered it in the national media. Um, but families feel this. Families feel what uh, having a household debt of 160% of your income means. And we know it's popular. We see a proliferation of television shows telling people how to deal with their debt. So the NDP really needs to take lessons from the left, 
popularize its message and make promises that cuts through a lot of this rhetoric and forces Harper out of his little uh, fake world of fake facts and actually have debates on, on a plane that average people can go, wait a minute, that is a lie. Because he, they might not understand foreign direct investment, but they certainly understand a day-to-day -day struggle and trying to make ends meet. I thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having thank me. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.